the most valuable piece of information we can provide to the breed associations is that feed intake because then they can incorporate that into that multi-trait selection tool that already has growth, has carcass, has other, you know, maternal reproduction, longevity traits all encompassed in there to really determine what is the most profitable. Welcome to another episode of the Beef Podcast Show. My name is Dr. Stephanie Hansen. I am a feedlot nutritionist at Iowa State University. And our guest today is Dr. Dan Scheich from the University of Illinois. Dan Scheich grew up on a diversified grain and livestock operation in Western Illinois. His family owns and operates Scheich Cattle Company, and he is actively involved with his father and brother in the management and marketing of the cattle. Scheich received his associate's degree from Blackhawk College East Campus and his bachelor's of science from Kansas State University and his master's and PhD from the University of Illinois. Currently, Scheich is an associate professor in animal sciences at the University of Illinois, responsible for teaching and research in beef cattle nutrition and management. He coached the livestock judging team from 2002 to 2011 and was the coordinator of the livestock judging team from 2012 to 2020. He has been invited to judge livestock shows and put on clinics in 40 states, as well as Australia and Canada. He is also the faculty supervisor for the University of Illinois' three beef cattle operations, a 150 head cow purebred um, Angus operation on campus, a 175 cow registered Sim Angus operation in Western Illinois, and an 800 cow commercial Angus operation in Southern Illinois. His research focuses on identifying nutritional strategies and management practices that improve efficiency, reproduction, and profitability in the beef cow-calf sector. Dan lives in Sedoris, Illinois with his wife, Jennifer, and their three children, Olivia, Hunter, and Harper. So welcome to the podcast, Dan. Hey, thanks for having me, Dr. Hansen. So um, Dan and I have known each other from a series of projects that we've worked together with things like feed efficiency. Uh, but let's go ahead and start out with, by having you tell listeners a little bit about your story. Tell us how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, so I grew up uh, on a farm in western Illinois. Um, both sides of my family were involved in production agriculture. Uh, my mom's family, um, my grandpa on that side was a veterinarian and raised cattle and also raised standard bred race horses. And then my dad's side of the family, his father, uh, raised uh, purebred Angus cattle and had uh, sows as well. And so I grew up around livestock and around production ag. I was involved in 4-H and, and FFA, uh, showed cattle uh, locally growing up and um, really started to get interested in livestock judging towards the end of my high school years and had an older brother that was two years older than me that went to Blackhawk College and uh, you know also was involved with livestock judging and he came home and he knew I, I really liked that and he said hey if you if you want to do this livestock judging you need to be a multi-species person. And so he helped me go find some pigs and some sheep to show uh, those last couple of years and show I showed all three species and really started to to have a passion for, for all of those species and evaluate and exhibit in them. And so I also then went to Blackhawk College and was on the judging team there. And uh, I really enjoyed that time and started to think about, you know, what do I want to do? Um, I never really wanted to be a veterinarian, even though my grandfather was. It wasn't anything negative. It just wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. But I knew I had a love for for livestock, and I um, started to, you know, explore different opportunities. And I went to Kansas State University uh, then next because I wanted to continue judging, and beef cattle was my first love. And so I thought oh, I want to go west where there's maybe a little bit more of a, a cattle. Uh, focus at, in that department. And so really enjoyed my time there at Kansas State University and competing on the judging team. But throughout all this time, I always had a um, connection with Dr. Doug Parrott here at the University of Illinois. And he had uh, recruited and visited with me about coming to Illinois uh, out of high school. And then again, um, after JUCO. And then again, he, he visited with me when I was a senior there at Kansas State. And he said, hey, why don't you come to Illinois? Uh, work on a master's and you can coach the livestock judging team. Well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And so I visited and really liked uh, the field here and learned a little bit about the different projects. Origin originally, I was thinking I had more interest on the repro side, but uh, once I learned more about nutrition and how uh, some of the nutrition work 
could impact reproduction or nutrition work could connect to growth and development or carcass. So like, hey, nutrition seems to be kind of a, a focal point here and with a lot of opportunity. So I came to the University of Illinois and uh, began a master's and began coaching the livestock judging team. And I never left. So 23 years later, I'm still here at the University of Illinois. Obviously, a lot of things happened throughout that time. Uh, uh, on my judging team at Blackhawk, I met my wife, uh, uh, Jennifer. So she was on the judging team at Blackhawk in Kansas State. So we got married that summer before we moved here and moved to this area, and, and we called it home since. Well, let's talk about a couple of things there. One, um, how was that transition going from being a graduate student at Illinois to suddenly finding yourself on faculty? Was that a pretty smooth transition, or was that something that was kind of challenging? Yeah, great question. And, and so I, I kind of skipped. There was a bit of an intermediate step. So when I finished my PhD, I actually went and interviewed for for one position at, at Michigan State University for a faculty position that was a research, teaching, extension, and uh, worked with their purebred herd there. Um, and when I returned from that interview, our department head here actually offered me a position as a visiting assistant professor. We were under a hiring freeze at the time. So I was in a visiting assistant professor position for four years. And so um, that allowed for a transition period because during that time, I was still mostly teaching and coaching the livestock judging team, but I started to work in more collaborative research roles and, and was involved in research projects with my advisor, Dan Faulkner. And then, you know, kind of allowed me to get to up and going and, and build that research before I was in a tenure track position. And so then uh, I was actually in that for, I guess, a little over three years and then interviewed for that tenure track position. So I think that time allowed me to transition, but, but yeah, it was interesting, especially doing it at the same place, right? One day you're walking down the halls as a student and the next day you're walking down the halls as, as a faculty member. And, um, I remember, you know, getting some advice from others that, Back then, I, I guess I looked fairly young and didn't look that, that different than them. But so I always wore khakis on the day I was teaching, and, and I probably even wore a tie a few of those days there initially, just to make sure that they knew that I wasn't the student. But uh, yeah, you you do have a bit of a transition time there when you're at the same institution. But uh, I had a great role models and mentors here within the department, and uh, they received me well, and then yeah, got off to a great start. I think that's a cool opportunity that you got with the the visiting position, right? To kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say it's like a postdoc, but you you got that benefit of having that before you were in the tenure track position, kind of figuring out which way it was up, and you could get that benefit of seeing what the other faculty were doing because that's such, you know, there's so many things in faculty that we don't get explicit training in as graduate students, and then it's like, here you go, go teach and run a million dollar research budget, and for you, manage your judging teams and young students and stuff, right? Yeah, it, it, it was like that. In fact, uh, I remember a faculty member at the time kind of referred to that as a glorified postdoc. And I wasn't sure how to take that, but I think it was exactly that. It, it was similar to a postdoc experience and it allowed me when I started my faculty position, uh, that, that transition, a tenure track position was, was very smooth because I'd, I'd already taught all the classes that I was teaching for several years, you know. And so I was in year four of teaching them. I didn't really have to to develop anything on the teaching side. And I also had a few research projects already going because of that collaborative research. Now, I didn't have a startup fund and I couldn't officially advise a student in that visiting role. It wasn't until I started the tenure track position that I had those additional resources. But yes, it uh, it really allowed me to to be in a great spot starting out. Let's talk a little bit more about your journey to your position there at Illinois via judging. Um, maybe first, in case we have any listeners who aren't completely aware with what judging might mean in this capacity, can you give us kind of a short explanation of what you're talking about there? Um, so let's start with that. Yeah, so uh, there's livestock judging contests that uh, are at the you know high school youth level and then at the collegiate level. And so many community colleges and uh, most of the land-grant universities have a livestock judging team. And so when they when they originally had these the the courses around breeding animal selection and that was really geared towards helping students who plan to go home and raise livestock you know be better stockmen and, and learn the principles of selection and animal breeding 
but it's kind of evolved to a, a sport, uh, so to speak. And so these livestock judging contests, uh, now they have cattle, pigs, sheep, and meat goats, and they would have classes. Typically a contest would have 12 classes and each class would have four animals. And so you place four heifers, you know, from first to fourth. And then, um, there would be a set of industry professionals there that would, uh, uh, put the official placing on it, and then the students are compared to that official placing. And on many of the classes, they then have an opportunity to go give a set of reasons or justify their placing to that official. And, uh, and so it really, you know, there's a lot of soft skills that uh, I believe the judging program has been, you know, tremendous at uh, providing to our students. So they, they learn decision making. Hey, you got 12 minutes to decide how to place this class. And then you have to defend that decision. Um, and so you, you learn your communication skills and, and it is, like I said, like a sport. So these students that are competing on these competitive teams, they're, they're putting many hours a weekend, you know, evenings, weekends, it could be 20 hours plus. And so they're balancing that while being a full-time student. So I really think that also helps provide good time management skills. And, uh, you know, there's, it's still a small, small world, right? Lots of people aren't totally familiar with it, but, uh, it is interesting and in visiting with former students, they'll be interviewing somewhere for a position that you might think has nothing to do with livestock judging. And there'll be somebody on there that's kind of aware of it. And they uh, start asking a few things or trying to convince the rest of the hiring committee why there's some, some great skills that this student probably picked up from livestock judging. And it didn't have anything to do with them knowing which effort was better than. Yeah, I think the judging is such an interesting thing, right? Because it has this like foundational history in the ability to distinguish the good, we'll just use the dairy heifer, for example, the one that we wanted to take home and put in the herd, right? The one that you were willing to put your money behind versus the one that you maybe didn't want to do that. And it's evolved into this very competitive, you know, kind of elite thing in some places, like in a good way. Um, but these are definitely the students that you see walking down the hallway at 530 in the evening as you're leaving the building and they've got their nose in a book or in a notepad and they're talking to themselves, getting ready to present their reasons for practice and stuff. So you can so see the work that they do. And I almost feel like you can tell the student who kind of came up through judging because they hold themselves a little bit differently. They have that projection in their voice. A lot of those inherent communication skills. We were chatting offline before we started recording about how some of our students struggle um, in, crowd, in college and graduate school to effectively communicate themselves. And this is a great way for them to learn that skill. Yeah, absolutely. They, they have to learn that confidence and being able to you know, walk into a room and communicate um, with a stranger about uh, the decision they've made. And, and so, yes, for many of them, uh, it's not comfortable, right? It's, they're no different than anybody else. Most students, when they start judging and giving reasons, they're, they're terrified about giving reasons. Public speaking is, it's just a small, small percentage of the people that initially say, oh, I like public speaking. But, um, I've had a few students through the past that, uh, I would tell you that, you know, absolutely terrified when they began when they finished, they still probably weren't the best speaker, but they had a, a totally new sense of of confidence in their ability to communicate. Yeah, I think that confidence is so important. I liked a couple of other words you talked about, decision-making, the ability to defend their choices. These are all things that, you know, even thinking about how they would come across in an interview later is a really important skill. So thinking about those skills and how you've kind of grown up in the judging world and then were a coach yourself, can you tell us a little bit about how you think that contributed to your success so far? Yeah. And I guess I'll, I'll hit on those. And then there's one other, I think, great benefit about being on a judging team that also has really helped contribute to to my success. And that is all the connections and contacts you make and the people you meet. And so in traveling around on those teams, you know, you, you visit farms, you, you meet with industry professionals, the, the people that I met while on the judging team at Blackhawk East and on the judge team at Kansas State University and then coaching for so many years here, I mean, those are lifelong friends and, and many of those people are, are in the industry, right? Looking back, I'll, I'll meet someone or come across someone and then we'll realize, oh, actually we just missed each other by a year, but we both have this kind of same background there. And so, you know, how did all this translate to, to graduate school? Well, uh, I guess, and to being a faculty member, I, 
I was uh, comfortable uh, talking and, and being in an interview. So I guess hopefully that was one of the things that helped. And, um, you know, I, I had the opportunity to, to visit with producers across the, the country. And so some of those were just small farmer feeders. Some of them were, you know, some of the elite seed stock operations. And, and we also and traveled to different universities and met with different academics. And so I speak to all those crowds still today. And, and so having past experience and, and just knowing the, the differences amongst those crowds and being able to connect, whether it's at a small, um, you know, producer meeting here or being able to, to go to a breed association and, and visit with their, their board. Or obviously we present at a, you know, a scientific meeting with other academics in the room. And so I think that's, that's helped. Um, and then those those connections back to that 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 helped me get here. But it's also one of the networks that I explore when looking for new students. I mean, I've had plenty of students that weren't on judging teams, but um, I I would say compared to some faculty, I probably have had a higher proportion of students that have been on a judging team. And it's not a requirement, but I do know that if I bring a, a new graduate student in that had participated on a judging team, they're probably not going to be afraid of hard work. They're probably going to have some basic time management skills. They're going to be a, a well above average communicator. And they're not going to be afraid to, to make a decision when under pressure, um, drawing on all their past experience and knowledge that they have. And I think those skills translate to success in a variety of situations. I think one of the things that's interesting about your journey, Dan, has been, you know, going from you know, being the kid who's showing, right, who's at the other end of the lead rope, to being the person who's judging, to being the person who's teaching the next generation how to judge. And then obviously through your role there at Illinois, you've had a lot of influence on the seed stock industry, but also worked with commercial cattlemen. Sometimes I think about, you know, this Venn diagram where we might have like the commercial cattle industry and we've got the show industry. And if we kind of overlaid them, that piece of the Venn diagram that would fit together in the middle would be our seed stock operations, right? Where they really can go either direction. I think you're in a unique position to talk about this. So tell us a little bit about maybe what your insights have been in recent years about what you're seeing in the show ring, what you're seeing with kind of trends and things like that with the seed stock industry, and then ultimately how that is impacting or maybe impacting decision-making on the commercial side. Yeah. And, and this is a topic I, I love to, to visit with. And, and you know, depending on, on the crowd and the audience, there's going to be a wide range of, of thoughts and opinions surrounding this. Some people are, you know, quite concerned and really get upset that there seems to be a, a significant disconnect at times between the show ring and the commercial world and, um, you know, think that it needs to be addressed and we must try to fix this. And I guess I do probably look at it from a, a different perspective because, I really am still involved with kind of all aspects of that. So my brother, you know, he raises show cattle. He sells, um, you know, steers and heifers to youth exhibitors or to, um, you know, people that then sell them to youth exhibitors for the sole purpose of, of showing. But he also has a commercial herd and production side behind that. And then here at the university, I, you know, I mentioned in the bio there that we, we have three herds here. One of them is an 800 cow commercial herd. And, and I mean, our selection... Uh, focus there is all based off of, you know, just being a, a profitable commercial beef production. So growth and carcass uh, on the terminal side and maternal traits and longevity, it doesn't matter what they look like. Um, you know, they just need to be good functional cattle that pay the bills. And uh, it's still hard for me to not look at them and not say, oh, I would change that thing, that physical characteristic. But if I doesn't relate to profitability, it's not something we're selecting. On. So yes, I, I do see all of the the different sides and then as you said the seat stock industry really sits in the middle with many of the the large seat stock operations um, catering to both worlds right selling bulls to commercial cattlemen um, with those bulls having to to be the the difference maker on that commercial operation making money or not and then also still probably selling some show heifers to, to youth exhibitors that uh, want to go out and be competitive and bring home a banner and so um What's interesting, and I think why this this concerns some people, or why it's such a topic of discussion. Originally, the show ring was the place where the commercial cattlemen went to see 
what are the cattle types supposed to be? What is the new trend? Where is the industry going? Where What is the next bull that I need to consider using? Starting back at the, you know, the international at Chicago, that that's where the trends were, right? Whatever was being selected there was, was where we were at. The steers matched the, the breeding stock and, you know, the, that type, if it was time for a type change, it started there and the the great livestock evaluators throughout time, you know, sometimes when it's time to make a change, one of them stepped up and used a different type. And then we saw this, this huge change, whether it was time when they were too little and too fat and too early maturing, and it was time to, to make them, you know, bigger and leaner and later maturing that first kind of began in the show ring. And then we had this trickle down effect. And so, um, and then like the national Western for, for years, if the, the Angus Bull or the Hereford Bull that won the National Western, they were probably going to be one of the top semen sellers um, in the industry. And that's not the case anymore. Not that they can't be, but just because you win the bull show at the National Western does not uh, guarantee any uh, specific amount of semen that's going to be sold like it maybe did in the past. And so, you know, why why have they grown apart? Well, why has the show ring become less and less, uh, you know, of a parallel to what we're doing in the commercial industry. There's a lot of reasons I, I mentioned to you ahead of time. My kids are involved in sports. I love sports uh, um, and youth sports. I I tried to participate when I was a kid. I wasn't uh, super athletically gifted, but uh, the way that sports have evolved it, is really fascinating to me. I went to a small school, um, played all sports. Everybody did. And you played that sport during that season for the most part. Now, even if you're at a small school, whatever sport you're best at, there's some expectation that you probably are working at that year round, or at least you have the opportunity to with travel sports. I mean, the resources available um, and all the little, whether it's nutrition, training, everything that they do for youth sports, that they're fine tuned athletes by the time they enter high school. And I think the show rings no different, right? Uh, evolution of the sport is what I call it, right? If, if, uh, you could do a little bit of work and be kind of competitive. Well, if we pay more attention to nutrition and if we work a little harder here, and yes, hair and fitting, all those things change how they kind of look. But if, if our goal is to be the best looking animal on the rank and there's all these things that we can do to do that, people are going to, going to put that extra time and effort in there. And so it really has become this, this sport of trying to, to win the banner. And so. I'm a competitive person. I think having competition and, and learning about competition and being, uh, learning from, you know, falling short of your goal and learning how to deal with it and be humble when you do win. Those are all important things. Um, so I think that that's still good. And then the other thing that I would, would say if someone's like, well, these, sh these shows, they're just, we need to, you know, move away from that. It, it's such a disconnect. It doesn't relate. I will tell you that uh, it's often the first window or the first opportunity for young people that have an interest in the livestock industry to be involved. Now, as livestock and industry leaders, it's our job to teach them there's a lot more to the livestock industry than the show ring. But if there's a young person that wants to be involved in 4-H and wants to show a calf at the county fair, and they fall in love with it. And a couple of years later, they're shown at the state fair. And a couple of years later, they're shown at the national show. And then they want to go to a college where they can maybe be on a judging team. And then they want to learn more about cattle and they want to work in your lab. If someone would have told them that they shouldn't show cattle 10 years ago, they would have never got to there. And so um, I, I still think it is one of our best opportunities to get young people involved. And no, not all people are going to show a, a national show or need to you know, put all the resources that it takes to try and win your state fair. But, uh, uh, whether it's just a, a few, and I mainly showed it at local shows growing up. My sister got to show it a lot bigger shows than I did. She was younger. So I kind of rambled there, but, uh, I think there's a lot, a lot of things that the show ring still offers, even if it's not the place that the commercial cattlemen are going to gather at to see where, where type is going. That's actually a really interesting kind of history lesson there, Dan. I didn't really realize that the show ring was where some of the type changes had been first initiated. And I completely echo your sentiment that 
anything that we can do, especially today when we have less and less students who are actually coming from a farm background, anything we can do to encourage interest and foster that interest in the beef industry is a great thing. I think maybe one of my concerns tends to be the disconnect that we've gotten where we've gotten really, really expensive animals or we've gotten, you know, when I was growing up, we just took cattle from grandma and grandpa's cow herd, right? And then eventually we bought a few animals, but it was still things that I had to get a loan for to be able to buy that. So I had to prove to the banker that I could try to hopefully not lose too much money on the deal. And, you know, sometimes you feel like some of the students are, well, the kids get like pushed out just because it's become such an expensive sport. And, and I 100% agree with that. My primary concern around the show ring is that and that the barrier to entry and that we need to continue to have opportunities for those that maybe don't have the resources. It, it's it's no secret that to to compete or to play the sport at the highest level, it, it is uh, you know significant amount of, of time and and money to to be able to do that. And so I think that there there are still things to do. And and I applaud the junior livestock associations for the efforts they've put into that. So any of the national junior heifer shows that you would go to they have a variety of, of contests and other competitions. So maybe, maybe you do just have a heifer from, you know, grandpa's lodge, not that she couldn't still win the show, but you know, you didn't go spend a lot of money on that, but you got a nice heifer. You've worked hard on her. You've learned a lot about it. You're probably not going to win the show. But you can go to that show and there's a ton of other contests, um, that you can participate in that's maybe test your, your knowledge, um, you know, or let you, they even have cooking contests at, at some of the national junior heifer shows, or you can be on judging teams. You can do a sales talk and, and try and sell your heifer. And so a lot of skills that, uh, um, allow you to still compete and sharpen those skills, speech contests. So I think they've done a great job of trying to provide other opportunities and to educate those students and, or those youth that are participating on the whole industry. That is, Hey, it's not just about the one kid that's going to come out with the big purple banner, even though I, I have nothing, nothing against trying to win that banner. I, I think competing for the banner is, is fun. And if you want to do that, I, I absolutely think you should, but I, I want to make sure that all, all youth that want to participate can still get value out of that, even if they know when they pull up there, they got no chance. I think that's a wonderful example. You know, the sweepstakes competitions where they do the judging or they do um, speech or, um, completely forgot the other like people's skill oh, skillathons exactly yep um ag olympics kind of things right like those are all great team building especially if you went across state lines kind of things to put teams together and yeah those were great uh, showmanship right showmanship doesn't you don't have to have the most expensive animal on the halter you can you just be the person that's knowledgeable and sharp and has honed their craft right that was always my thing i was like i'm going to win showmanship i know i'm not going to win the for show <laughs> yeah and i think those students that uh you know, participate in, in all of those contests and push themselves to really take full advantage of, of all those opportunities. And then, you know, as we, the students get older, there's leadership positions in those breed associations and, and even at the state level. And so, uh, I, and we're developing future leaders in, in the livestock and ag industry through the show ring. Um, not that it's the on, only way, but, uh, if anybody starts to say that the show ring, you know, doesn't have the, uh, any value or doesn't have the same value. It is different, but, uh, boy, I'll, I'll draw a big line in the sand and, and bow up on that. It doesn't have any value because it is our future. One of our, our greatest opportunities to develop future leaders. So you talked a little bit about junior, um, organizations and, and kind of alluded to the breed associations there. So tell us a little bit about some of your experience, uh, maybe specifically thinking about there in Illinois with your herds and stuff, what, um, the breed associations that you've worked with. And then also let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the roles that those breed industries, our breed associations have had with having influence on, you know, where the industry is moving, what kind of research we're doing, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, uh, we, we really had a, a great opportunity here at the University of Illinois. Um, I was fortunate when, when I was a graduate student, they built a new beef farm here. And so, um, you know, I, like I said, I was just a graduate student and, and right when I was finishing up, that farm was, was finishing up and it had um, very large grow safe capacity. So we had the capabilities of feeding 
a large number of cattle on that grow safe system to get individual feed intake. And so we were well positioned then to start working with with breed associations, because that was right around the time where there was tremendous interest in collecting these phenotypes and individual feed intake. So first worked with the Angus Association and the Simmental Association, and, and some of that work was started, um, you know, while I was a grad student, so kind of before me, but I was able to continue working with, with those breed associations. We also, you know, were providing uh, carcass data as well, but I think that the real initial interest was on our capabilities on the feed intake side. And then as you mentioned, we worked together on that uh, feed efficiency project. And so through that, uh, we also had the opportunity to work with the Charlet Association and the Red Angus Association on uh, phenotyping some of their cattle and, um, and, you know, helping get not only the feed intake, but we are also taking uh, DNA samples so they could genotype those cattle as they were trying to to build their um, genomic enhanced database as well and those breed associations and then you know after that project we continued to to work with some additional breed associations and later worked with the Shorthorn Association the Kenya Association and currently working with the Hereford Association so they really have had the opportunity to, to work with a number of them. And throughout each of those, we, you know, we had opportunities to host breed association uh, meetings. And so they had field days here and allowed, uh, you know, them to, to kind of have a different site to host those meetings and for them to get a glimpse into our facility and the research we're doing and, and the teaching program we have. And so, I, like I said, I, I kind of grew up in the, the livestock and purebred seed stock industry and, and have maintained a lot of connections uh, going back to, to judging. You know, a lot of my contacts of those breed associations were either people that I, I got to meet when I was on a judging team or in some cases, you know, maybe judged with or, or coached with. And so that those connections uh, have really helped. And, and I enjoy that role. And you ask the question, so how do they influence? And, and I think it's huge, the role and the influence those breed associations have, because we really have uh, kind of a top-down, trickle-down effect, right? If the breed association says that this trait is important and they develop an EPD and collect the data to, you know, build the EPD and their seed stock producers will start to select for that trait. And we have seen time and time again as uh, these traits come out that are heritable. Our seed stock producers are, are very good at selective form and, and we move the needle. And so even the average animal at those seed stock operations are now better for that specific trait. And so the commercial bull buyer, even if they're not going to try and buy the best bull for let's, let's say, you know, a feed efficiency trade or marbling or whatever, um, uh, Marbling has improved significantly in all of those breeds because of selection for it. So even if they're not trying to select for it, their bulls are better, and now their cow herd's better, and we've seen that, right? Our feedlot cattle, the genetic trend line for growth and for carcass merit is pretty fascinating, and I would say in, in many cases, those commercial cattlemen weren't specifically selecting for that. They're just trying to get the best bull they could in their budget, and that bull happened to be better than the last one. Let's talk a little bit about the feed efficiency work that you've done there, because I know that would be kind of a common thread through a lot of those different breed associations you guys have worked with. Um, and I know you've done a lot of work with feed efficiency, so maybe I'll challenge you to say, can you share what you think might be two or three of the biggest, I don't know, insights into feed efficiency in beef cattle that you think listeners might want to hear about? Sure. And so I'll start with feed intake, uh, because it's the simpler trait. Um, and, and I think one of the, the more fascinating and, and fortunate things that we have found in our work and others have as well is feed intake um, appears to be fairly repeatable. And I'll be honest, when I first started looking into this, I, I wasn't as sure about that. You know, would feed intake repeat itself at different stages of production? So let's say in a set of growing steers, would the high intake cattle also be the high intake cattle on, on, in the finishing phase if we're on the same diet, right? They're just, once they reach different stages of maturity, would, would they be re-ranking or would it hold true? Or if we had a set of heifers and we tested them on more of a grain-based diet and then later 
you know, they're out on, on a forage-based diet, would intake still be related? Or if we did an intake evaluation on a post-weaning heifer and brought her back in as a two-year-old or a five-year-old cow, are the high intake animals still the high intake? And what we found across all that is it, it is pretty correlated, you know, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, regardless of diet type, stage of production, or in those cows, you know, from heifer to, to mature cow, they are um, fairly repeatable on the intake side. So that, that's encouraging because most of the breed association feed intake records are feedlot steers on a grain-based diet, okay? Uh, more of the breed associations are, are trying to work on getting, you know, forage-based intake and a heifer system. Measuring grazing intake is still the the holy grail, so to speak, right? And then uh, that's really, that's where our greatest opportunity to improve the industry is. All right, so 70% of our feed resources are on the cow side and 70% of those go to maintenance of the cow. So basically half of all the feed the beef industry uses is just to maintain the cow herd. And so anything that we could do to um, improve feed efficiency and, and you know, intake, and efficiency are obviously related. They're not one and the same. Uh, and I often, when I'm talking about this topic with producers, I, I like to yeah, show a hands that you could select just for intake, would you pick the high intake or the low intake animals? And, you know, not everyone agrees on that. If there's more of a, a dairy influence crowd, they're like high intake, right? High intake, high milk. And, uh, and so there's probably an in-between. It's what is that intake relative to our, our production? High intakes can obviously cost us too much money if they just eat a lot and don't produce anymore. But I have some serious reservations about really low intake cattle. You know, what will that mean for a grazing animal and, and tough conditions where she really needs to actively forage the majority of the day? Would a quote a low intake cow have that same, you know, drive and appetite and ability to go and forage? So on the feed efficiency side, it's messier. And that's probably because it's a it's a dirty trait, so to speak, right? It's the relationship of feed to a level of production. And so you could have a feed efficient animal for more than one reason. It could be that they had a moderate intake and a greater average daily gain, or it could be that they had kind of moderate gain and a, a lower intake, right? Those two animals could still be similar on their feed efficiency, but for different reasons. And since we still sell them by the pound, um, you know, we don't want to give up too much production. So we would like to be able to select cattle for a set production point, whatever that gain or mature size of animal we think's best for our operation. Then within that, I want the ones that require the, the least amount of inputs. And so, uh, what we found is that, you know, that feed efficiency across different periods, it, it is correlated, sometimes not as well. But I often think that's mainly because gain is far less repeatable over two periods of time. It, it's just tracking average daily gain over short periods of time is tricky, right? Part of it's because of how we weigh them and if, are they full or are they empty? But also, um, cattle, they, they have been flow in their gain. Sometimes, whether it's a health challenge or something else, they maybe, um, you know, kind of sit still for a while. And then in that next period, they'll have some compensatory gain. Often intake stays more consistent across those periods, but their gains look very, very different. And, and so then, depending on which snapshot we look at them, we would characterize them as different feed efficiencies. And I'm not sure that's 100% right. So... Uh, you know, where, where are we on that? We need to continue to work on it. And I like um, measuring and assessing feed intake as an individual tree. Uh, I'm not a geneticist. I don't ever claim to be. I have lots of friends that are. And, you know, they've done a really good job of building multi-trait selection tools. And they need lots of good individual traits to put into that. So if we're talking about a seed stock selection tool, I do, and not everyone's going to agree on this, but I do think that the most valuable piece of information we can provide to the breed associations is that feed intake, because then they can incorporate that into that multi-trait selection tool that already has growth, has carcass, has other, you know, maternal reproduction, longevity traits all encompassed in there to really determine what is the most profitable. Now, 
understanding the underlying biology and a research model, that that's a different question. And, and it is fascinating that we can have two animals at, at a snapshot in time that are very different feed efficiency. And, and I'm still very interested in trying to understand what is different about these two animals that they appear to be doing very, very different things on the same amount of feed. And so trying to understand that feed efficiency, whether it's you know, some underlying genetic difference, or do we have a difference in, um, you know, the microbial community? You know, what, what is it about this animal and can we influence it through genetics? Can we influence through nutrition management? You know, that is still very much of interest to me. Well, I had noted that same question, Dan, as you were talking, have we learned anything about how like that cow who has the big intake drive right like i have i have a line of those cows and their her calves every year are the same way right get out of my way i'm on my way to the feed bunk and then i have a line of cows that are like what look a squirrel like you know get distracted when they should be chowing down right um have we learned anything about like the you know the leptin the ghrelin the the hormones that drive feed intake are those different in those cows there there are definitely underlying differences. And, and I think what's what's interesting is, is, you know, again, when we characterize and how we characterize those animals and, and what the answer that we're going to get there is. And and I think that it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a simple recessive trait, right? It's not like we flip it on or off. It, it is such a, a complex trait with so many different drivers there. And and I really believe that, uh, yes, there are high intake and low intake cattle, but I also think there's variation within that. I think some cows have the ability to turn that up during times of need, right? So we know that that intake can go up during lactation. I don't think that they all do it the same, right? You can look at the, the textbook and see what the percent on average increase is, but I'm pretty sure not all cows do that the same, right? And so depending on when we're assessing and characterizing that, we may get different answers. So. Uh, there's there's probably more to learn than what we we know there, um, and maybe I, I skirted your question a little bit, but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's fascinating, and we need to we need to continue to to look at this. But the other thing that it, there's so many different environments and settings, and and it's one of the challenges. Even you know, so we have this this beautiful facility here where we can bring animals in and put them in a building and assess their their intake there. But how does that translate? to a cow out on a pasture. And as a cow in a pasture like we have here in central Illinois or that, that you see in central Iowa, how's that different than the desert out west, right? How do these things translate across these different regions? What we may identify as, you know, some good biological descriptors of, of intake and efficiency in the barn may not match across those. So we, we have to keep working there, but it's, it's a worthy cause. Uh, again, that the cow herd uh, requires a lot of, a lot of inputs and anything we could do to, to optimize or maximize that would absolutely affect the industry's bottom line. Yeah. I mean, like a lot of the research that we do in my shop is focused on how do we make the most use out of the resources that that steer consumes, right? We're looking for the optimal gain and trying to figure out the nutritional package to support that. So thinking about uh, the feed efficiency work that you've done and, and others, one of the things that's always, I think, that came out of our big feed efficiency grant that we had from 2010 to 2015 was this question of, when we think about testing bulls, are we paying enough attention to the diet that we're testing those bulls on? Are we getting, are we making different selection choices because we're testing bulls in some situations on much higher grain diets than higher forage diets? Yeah, and so that that was something that um, you know we we absolutely tried to assess, and and there's different ways to look at it. And the the project that we did here, you know, we looked at uh, forage versus grain and in, in the feedlot, not not on bulls, but uh, we did see some correlation as a. a mentioned there and pretty strong correlation across those diet types. I initially was was pretty concerned that, hey, if we're testing cattle on a grain-based diet where they're gaining four pounds a day, but then we're using that to select future replacements um, that are going to mainly be on forage, could we really be missing the mark? And, and I still think there's there's obviously a, a little uh, concern there, but but those those are correlated. Now, to your bull question, 
and, and this is, we could have a whole hour talking about this. There's, there's a lot of different strategies on developing these bulls, right? Some bulls are pushed pretty hard. Some bulls are, you know, fed a lot slower. Some claim they feed them slower and still feed them harder, right? So there, there's a full spectrum there on how these bulls are developed. And, and I think that the bulls that excel in each of those systems are going to vary. And I guess my my advice is always to, to bull buyers, try and buy a bull from an operation that looks the most like you. And it's still a seed stock operation, so there's still going to be some differences. But if you're in the fescue belt, you know, there's there's good reason to buy bulls that are developed in the fescue belt on, on fescue, right? I try and identify the cattle that will excel on the diet type and in the environment that you're going to ask them to work in. Now, if you're trying to find a bull to raise primarily, you know, terminal feedlot cattle that you want to, to and you're going to retain ownership and you're going to get to capture all that value for the high rate of gain in the feedlot, well, then, you know, buying the bull that excelled on a grain-based test and was cranking out five, six pounds a day uh, and outdid his contemporaries, that's probably okay for you because that's kind of the bull you're looking for. Um, but I, you know, to the, I do have a little concern of how we market that. And, and I, and I realize if, you know, if I test my set of bulls and I'm going to share that information with my bull buyers, but you know, how, how my cattle do on my test is not comparable to how somebody else's cattle did on their test. I mean, it's no different than, you know, saying that, well, my weaning weight was 800 and that's better than your weaning weight that was 600. Well, maybe I fed them twice as much, right? So um, comparing across bull, buy, you know, seed stock producers is dangerous. The, that's why we have EPDs to do that. I, I think it's great that a lot of them are doing some individual tests and providing that information. And it is additional information that is of value within that contemporary group. But if, if you're trying to decide if you're going to buy a bull from, you know, seed stock producer A, B, or C, trying to see who had the highest ratio in bull within those individual contemporary groups is is useless, right? That's, you're not making the right comparison there. I don't know, Dan, you dropped the C word, contemporary. <laughs> you sound like a geneticist. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, oh, I'll go back to that. I'm not a geneticist. And I'll, uh, again, uh, if I get too far over there, I'll just let my geneticist friends tell me to be quiet and they'll, they'll take it from there. Okay, I want to uh, wrap us up with a couple of things before we go to our final questions. One of them was, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys have recently installed some of the GrowSafe water recording systems? Yep, yep. So we have GrowSafe beef and a couple barns, and so that's the in-pen weighing system, as well as uh, we're able to to get water intake with flow meters. So, um, yeah, we just recently have put those in, and, um, you know, I, I think we'll had had a set of cattle on those last fall and, and continuing to, to work through kind of some of our validation on that. But yeah, I'm excited about uh, both those opportunities. So I mentioned the uh, challenges with trying to track body weight gain over short periods of time. And so with this in-pen weighing system, you're getting multiple weights every day. Every time they go get a drink of water, we get a partial body weight. And you know, some are like, oh, it's partial body weight. How can that be good? Well, we're getting lots of them, and the partial body weight is highly correlated to the, the entire animal's body weight. So when we can get multiple weights in a day, and we don't have the disruption of pulling them out of a pen and being off feed for a couple hours and going through and being weighed and emptied out and stressed. And, you know, there, there's a lot of power in that. And so especially if you want to track body weight change over short periods of time. So excited about that potential. And then, uh, yeah, water is, you know, Water's not a scarcity where we live, but it's a scarcity in a lot of places. And, and so understanding um, everything that we can about water intake, water efficiency, no different than feed intake and feed efficiency um, and how that, that relates to the whole sustainability of, of beef production, I think is, um, you know, an important topic moving forward. And there's been work done on that already. Obviously, there's, there's other systems, other people that have them in place. But uh, yes, we're excited to add that capacity here as well. Yeah, I think that's going to be such a cool tool. I've always been fascinated by water efficiency. Um, and I think it's a, going to be a neat opportunity for you guys there with all the breed association work that you do, right? So 
does an animal who has high dry matter intake also have high water intake? And is that a part of that you know consideration? Or can you find the animals who diverge and still have higher of one, but they're more moderate on their water? How does that translate to how much muscle they put down? Because muscle is such a large percentage of water, like just the sky's the limit. And I love this idea. If I had big enough pens, believe you me, I'd, I'd have grow safe beef. My pens at Iowa State are too narrow. So our bedding pack sits right next to the water. And so we can't have the scale thing there. Um, but I'm starting to investigate opportunities for how do we have continuous cameras in the pens to be able to have estimates for body weights, right? Like you're right, we need to have these continuous monitorings of things and that's that's really cool i think that's such a neat feature for the beef industry research and the, the cameras and the sensors so that's uh, it's gonna be really exciting to see what comes in that front we're, we're behind on other species and in, in that regard but uh you know i know there's lots of places and we, we're pretty excited about uh what we have going in that uh precision livestock management space here and at the university of illinois with a couple of recent hires and whether it's, you know, cameras, sensors, whatever, and then all, all of the additional phenotypes that we can kind of get in real time and what what we could do with that from a management or a selection standpoint. It's pretty exciting. Absolutely. Uh, well, before we jump to our final three questions, is there anything else that you want listeners to know about some of the things that you're working on there right now? Well, um, well so, you know, I guess we didn't hit on too much of, of my current research, but, uh, you know, I... Really, I'm interested in the entire beef system. So from conception all the way to final end product, most of my work does focus on the cow-calf side. But since the goal of the cow-calf industry is to raise a calf that will eventually, uh, you know, go go to market, we like to follow them all the way through. But uh, most most of my stuff right now is still on, on that cow side and managing that cow herd. So kind of an equal split between trying to extend the grazing season with uh, grazing cover crops, grazing corn stock residue, uh, anything we can do with uh, grazing management, some stockpiling, kind of a two stockpile system we've been evaluating. So what, whatever we can do to get as, as fewer days as possible uh, of feed and stored or purchased feed is, is really a goal. But then also at the same time, I do a lot of uh, dry lot work. So we have producers that they can't graze. Right? So even though we should graze as long as we can, we have producers that want to expand their, their cow herd. Land's too expensive. There's not pasture available in their area. What are our options? Can we put them in buildings? Can we dry lot them? Can we do this extended dry lot? So we've been working in that space and, and excited about um, what we've done there. We you know, initially did some comparisons just to pasture, but now we're kind of shifting more of a focus on what are some of our best management practices within this confinement or dry lot because we have producers that are doing it they are not really interested in seeing the comparison versus pasture anymore this is what they're doing they just want to know what's the best way to manage these cows in this system that this kind of their new new way of doing it so i know you guys have done some research with um like the rubber mats right and looked at structure and some different things like that um is there another example of some kind of dry lot cow focused work that you guys have been working on yeah so and that was more on the feedlot side, but on the cow-calf side, over at the Ore Beef Research Center, that's where we've done uh, the extended dry lot. So where we've compared just keeping those cows in all summer as opposed to turning out in April. And then recently we've looked at uh, um, creep feeding in there. And so that that's the one of the questions we get, what's the best way to feed these calves? Should we let them just eat the TMR alongside the cow? Should we creep feed them? Do we need to creep feed them the whole time? Obviously, creep feeding is not a new question, but there's a pretty big difference between creep feeding cows on pasture and creep feeding in the dry lot. In the dry lot, the calves don't have anything to eat. Um, they can nibble on some bedding, and depending on what you're feeding the cow, it can, but most of our operators that are doing dry lot uh, or confinement cow calf, they're feeding, you know, more energy dense diet and limit feeding it, and bunk space is pretty, pretty tight. The cows, you know, they're going to eat that in the first couple hours, and, and it'd be pretty difficult for a calf to squeeze up their meat. In. So if you're not creep feeding, that means all the calf's getting is milk. So from 60 days on, they're absolutely not getting their, you know, needs matter. So they're going to be at a body weight and at a gain that is far below their genetic potential. So we've looked at, you know, different creep durations and just finishing up the first study on that and no surprise, the calves were very, very different in weight uh, when we weaned them. 
interestingly enough, the compensatory gain on the ones that only had creep for the last three weeks prior to weaning has been amazing, even better than I thought. And um, we'll see, they're scheduled to go here in another month, but they're on track to catch them. And I knew they would make up some of the ground, but I did not think they would catch them considering they had, you know, 80 some days in the, in the dry lot there where the, all they got was milk. That's interesting. I'm mentally tying together some of our conversations with prior guests talking about how much milk the modern beef cow can make in some cases, right? Like often way more than that calf might actually typically nurse, but maybe this is a situation where that calf's like, I'm hungry because I don't have any you know, grass to graze. And maybe they go drive that. Yeah. The, the milk thing is, is really fascinating. I, I think well, there are cows out there that, that have more milk than what their calf needs. And there are still cows out there that, that don't have enough milk production, especially for so, some situations like this. Now, I don't know if it makes sense to uh, select for cows that have that added milk. Now, the advantage would be if we really are talking about dry lot only, there could, could be potential to run cows with a greater milk potential to feed that calf. The, the risk of doing that out in a grazing setting is, is that that cow simply wouldn't be able to meet her nutrition needs on your forage base. And then she gets thin and then she doesn't breed back. And that was all because he wanted a little more milk. But in our dry lot, when we're feeding a TMR, if we know that we've selected for more milk potential because we don't want to creep those calves, it would be easy enough to adjust the diet. But the question then becomes, is it cheaper to feed the calf or to select for a cow with more milk production and, and feed her 10 or 15 percent more or whatever you would need to to maintain that condition yeah absolutely well like all good research we're left with 10 more questions for yes. each one that we answer <laughs> all right well this has been really great dan let's wrap up with our final three questions here for the podcast so the first one is what is your favorite beef resource all right, so I'm probably going to break the rules and not give you the right answer for any of them, but I'll give you three. Uh, so Travis Matier is our uh, University of Illinois Beef Extension Specialist, and he has excellent set of resources. So I usually look there first, and, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on here with you, but uh, Iowa Beef Center obviously has tremendous resources. And then I like to look through the Nebraska Beef Reports there too and kind of see what's, what's up and coming on, on their stuff. So those would kind of be three of the places that I, I look um, to start with. Yeah, that's awesome. We actually haven't got those three specific or those ones yet. We've heard about ebeef.org and the NRC and um, some Oklahoma State uh, resources and kind of a variety. So yeah, I like that question. Okay, the second question is, is there an example of a non-beef book that you're reading right now? Like I said, I'm, I'm going to break the, the rules here. I, I don't have one. Um, I have never probably been as good at that as I, I should. I, I tend to try and, and keep up best I can on on beef and livestock things and livestock publications, but I don't, uh, I'm not one that just picks up a book to, to read for fun. I'm probably more likely to, uh, you know, watch a, a game or, you know, maybe a, a show with, with my wife on the TV for a few minutes before I fall asleep. Uh, she tells me I usually struggle to make it past the first commercial, but, uh, I'm not one to, to grab a book at night. Well, we'll forgive you because you have two kids in high school, right? And then yeah. a younger one? I have a junior, a freshman, and then a third grader. So yeah, most of our evenings and weekends are filled with plenty of uh, kids' activities and sports, and FFA. And, and they show pigs, right? Yeah, and they show pigs and goats and horses and going to show sheep this year too. So Nice, nice. Sounds like they're coming full circle for you. <laughs> Okay, third and final question is, is there a trait in someone that you admire that has helped make them successful? Yeah, so I had thought about that one a little bit, and, and I mentioned uh, Dr. Doug Parrott earlier. And so Dr. Parrott was uh, the judging team coach and a professor, teacher, and extension specialist here at the University of Illinois for many, many years, and a great mentor to me. And we lost him this past fall, but... Uh, he had an incredible ability to just connect with people. And it didn't matter if it was a, a beef producer, a prospective student, faculty member, industry leader. You know, he, he just had an ability to connect with them and, and make them feel 
heard and and, and special and, and you knew that that he just he cared about you and um you know i think that among many of other very desirable traits he had i think that was one of the things that really helped him to be successful is just he just walk into room and, and you just wanted to go visit with him because you knew that he was going to genuinely be interested in visiting with you. Yeah, that's great. I have read a couple of the different articles and stuff that you've contributed to talking about Dr. Parrott and you know how he influenced you over the years. So I think that's a really, really special tribute. All right, Dan. Well, we've reached the end of our time together here. We appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed and uh, covered a lot of different topics there. But uh, yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Awesome.